I'm glad to be before you once again on this pretty Lord's Day. If you would, be turning your Bibles to Acts chapter 8. I would like for us to consider a passage in that chapter. Acts chapter 8, beginning in verse 26. <coughs> the Bible there says, And the angel of the Lord spake unto Philip, saying, Arise, and go toward the south, unto the way that goeth down from Jerusalem unto Gaza, which is desert. And he arose and went, and behold, a man of Ethiopia, a eunuch of great authority, under Candace, the queen of the Ethiopians, who had the charge of all her treasure, and had come to Jerusalem for to worship, was returning, and sitting in his chariot, read Esaias the prophet. Then the spirit said unto Philip, Go near, and join thyself to this chariot. And Philip ran thither to him, and heard him read the prophet Esaias, and said, Understandest? thou what thou readest? And he said, How can I except some man should guide me? And he desired Philip that he would come up and sit with him. The place of the scripture which he read was this, He was led as a sheep to the slaughter, and like a lamb dumb before his shearer, so opened he not his mouth. In his humiliation his judgment was taken away, and who shall declare his generation? For, this, for his life is taken from the earth. And the eunuch answered Philip and said, I pray thee, of whom speaketh the prophet this, of himself or of some other man? Then Philip opened his mouth and began at that same scripture and preached unto him Jesus. And as they went on their way, they came unto a certain water. And the eunuch said, See, here is water. What doth hinder me to be baptized? And Philip said, If thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And he commanded the chair to stand still, and they went down both into the water, both Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. And when they were come up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord caught away Philip, that the eunuch saw him no more. And he went on his way rejoicing. From this account we see a case of conversion. From it let us note the following. The eunuch was rather religious, but still lost. Verses 27 and 28. He was willing and able to be taught. Verses 29 through 34. From verse 35 we note that Philip preached Jesus to this man. And at the conclusion of this teaching came baptism. Verse 36 through 38. What I would like for us to consider this morning is the eunuch's inquiry. See, here is water. What doth hinder me to be baptized? This question shows that baptism is a component of one teaching or preaching Christ to another. Jesus himself commanded it, Matthew chapter 28, verses 19 through 20, as, ma as well as Mark chapter 16, verses 15 and 16. From Acts chapter 2, verse 38, chapter 10, verse 47 and 48, and various other passages, we see that his apostles taught the same. Thus, with the eunuch's question in mind, I would like for us to consider this morning several things that might hinder us from being baptized. First, a lack of faith will hinder one from being baptized. We know from Hebrews chapter 11 verse 6 that faith is necessary in order to be pleasing to God. For without it, it is impossible to please Him. For he that cometh to God must believe that He is, and that He is a rewarder of them that diligently seek Him. Philip taught the eunuch that it, faith is a prerequisite to salvation, Acts chapter 8, verse 37. Jesus taught its necessity in John chapter 8, verse 24. It is thus a natural starting point in one's journey to being faithful to God 
Romans chapter 10, verse 17. Without faith, one cannot be baptized. Thus, without faith, one cannot be saved. Secondly, a lack of repentance will hinder one from being baptized. In Acts chapter 17, verses 30 and 31, we know that repentance is commanded by God. It says there, In the times of this ignorance God winked at, but now commandeth all men everywhere to repent, because he hath pointed a day in the which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he hath ordained, whereof he hath given assurance unto all men, and that he hath raised him from the dead. We're expected to repent because there will come a time where we will be judged by our deeds in light of the law in which we're under. At this time, we're under the law of Christ. We know that repentance is a prerequisite to baptism. This is seen in the sermon of Acts chapter 2. These hearers were confronted with the fact that they had murdered Jesus, the very Son of God. This prompted them to inquire what was necessary for them to be saved, what they must do in order to obtain salvation. They obviously possessed faith at this point, but now also needed to, be, to repent. We see in Luke chapter 13, verses 1 through 5, that Jesus stressed the importance of repentance. And we know from Acts chapter 3, verse 19, that repentance is needed in order to blot out our sins, to cover them, to have them removed. Without repentance, baptism remains hindered. Third, a lack of confession will hinder one's baptism. Confessing Christ brings one unto salvation. Not into, but unto that point of salvation. Romans chapter 10, verses 9 through 10. It's written there that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Publicly confessing one's faith in Christ as the Son of God is necessary as part of God's plan for man's salvation. It also boldly sets you apart from the rest of the world. You have many figures in the public's eye that say there are many different ways to God or that Jesus was only a prophet and was not the Son of God. Yet the Bible tells us otherwise. There is only one way to the Father and that is through Jesus Christ. Jesus promises to confess us before his Father if we confess him. Luke chapter 12, verse 8. But he also promises to deny us before his Father if we deny him. Matthew chapter 10, verse 32. Thus, without confession, baptism remains hindered. Fourth, a lack of water will hinder one's baptism. New Testament baptism is an immersion or a burial in water. Acts chapter 8 verse 36 as we read as well as chapter 10 verse 47. It is a burial just as Jesus was buried. Romans chapter 6 verses 3 through 4 says there, Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death? Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. Being buried in this manner washes away our sins. Acts chapter 22 verse 16. Thus this can only be fulfilled when there is enough water to do so. This is important regarding how denominations, quote, baptize. Many practice sprinkling, pouring, or dipping. The result of this practice is a soaked and yet still lost individual. Lack of water then hinders a scriptural baptism. Fifth, a prideful attitude will hinder one from being baptized. Some are too proud to admit that they even need salvation. 
Proverbs chapter 16, verses 18 and 19 says, Pride goeth before destruction, and an haughty spirit before fall. Better it is to be an humble spirit with the lowly than to divide the spoil with the proud. Some are too proud to acknowledge the scriptural need for baptism. They deny that it is even a part of one's salvation, let alone the fact that they need it. Such an attitude will keep one from God. In fact, it makes one an enemy of God. Psalm, chapter, or Psalm 138, verse 6, and John chapter 4, verse 6, excuse me, James chapter 4, verse 6. We read of another prideful man, and that is Naaman, in 2 Kings chapter 5. We see that he was prideful. He was told to do what was necessary in order to cleanse his leprosy. And we find his reaction in verses 11 through 13. It says, But Naaman was wroth at the information he'd received, and went away, and said, Behold, I thought he will surely come out to me, and stand, and call the name of the Lord his God, and strike his hand over the place, and recover the leper. Are not Abanal and Parpar rivers of Damascus better than all the waters of Israel? May I not wash in them and be clean? So he turned and went away in a rage. And his servants came near and spake unto him and said, My father, if the prophet had bid thee do some, some great thing, wouldest thou not have done it? How much rather then when he saith to thee, Wash and be clean? Then he went down and dipped himself seven times in Jordan, according to the saying of the man of God. And his flesh came again like unto the flesh of a little child, and he was clean. We see that Naaman was angry due to the steps needed for his cleansing. And he went away. Yet, thankfully for him, due to the wisdom of his servants, he would be persuaded to obey the commands of God. This resulted in him being cleansed of his leprosy. Many follow after his example of pride and arrogance. Unfortunately, they allow it to hinder their soul salvation. They allow it to hinder them from being baptized. Sixth, family can sometimes hinder one from being baptized. Some are too concerned about, about what their family will think of them after they become baptized, become a Christian. They may be afraid of being mistreated or maybe even disowned by their family members. But Jesus makes it abundantly clear that this should never prevent one from obeying the gospel of Christ. Matthew chapter 10, verses 36 through 39 says, And a man's foes shall be they of his own household. He that loveth father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he that loveth son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And he that taketh not his cross and followeth after me is not worthy of me. He that findeth his life shall lose it. And he that loseth his life for my sake shall find it. You see, salvation is more important than the threatening of family members. Sometimes people are more interested in believing in what mom and daddy taught rather than what is right what, but the, what, by what the Bible teaches. Thus, following them to hell and not being able to give it a second thought. Perhaps family members are members of the church, yet they're unfaithful. Are they good examples of what Christ would have us be? You see, the home is where all teaching must and God expects for teaching to begin. Not just in how to be fully functional in this world and the flesh, but also to be pleasing to God. Are we as parents the good examples to our children of what Christians ought to be? Or are we poor examples, maybe even a stumbling block? Even in light of these things, we should not allow our family members to be a deterrent. In Numbers chapter 2, we're given an account where Miriam and Aaron began to speak against Moses. They tried to claim that he was not God's only prophet. 
Yet we know that he was commissioned by God to be the prophet to lead Israel out of Egypt and to lead them through the wilderness. And for their rebellion, God sharply rebuked them and punished them. We see in Luke chapter 16 where the rich man wished salvation for his family members back on the earth. Yet we note that the choice was left to them while they were alive. They had proper evidence, and at the time they had the law of Moses. The time was up for the rich man, yet the brethren of him, his brethren, had plenty of time, at least potentially, to change their lives. And we're told by Abraham in that account that they cannot be saved if the scriptures would persuade them or did not persuade them. So it is the case with us. As parents, we must be the good examples for our children because there will come a time where our influence will, will uh, loosen and our children will become accountable before God and they will be expected to be responsible for their own actions, their own thoughts. And they will be expected to render obedience to their creator. That one day will be too late for mom and daddy to have much influence over them. To teach them what is needed to be saved. To be the good examples that they should have been all along. Instead, one must resolve to be faithful in spite of their parents. In spite of their other family members. And they must not allow them to hinder them from being baptized. We would rather be the example of the believers. 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 12. Seventh, <clears throat> peer pressure can hinder us from being baptized. Some are afraid of what their peers might think or say about them if they ever do become a Christian. We see that peer pressure keep, or kept some from confessing their faith in Christ. John chapter 12, verses 42 through 43. says, Nevertheless, among the chief rulers, also many believed on him. But because of the Pharisees, they did not confess him, lest they should be put out of the synagogue. For they loved the praise of men more than the praise of God. Jesus made it clear that we should not be swayed by the opinions of others. Luke chapter 9, verse 26. One must realize that being righteous causes confusion on the part of the evildoers. 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 1 through 4. They're going to think it's strange that you no longer run with them. When you know better and you start doing better and you become a Christian, and you stop engaging in those sinful behaviors, they're going to think it's strange that you're doing so. That's a good thing. This will ultimately bring persecution, though. 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 12. This should not be a deterrent, however. It should be considered an occupational hazard, and we need to galvanize ourselves against it. Unfortunately, many allow peer pressure to hinder them from being baptized. <clears throat> Eighth, some think they need to have a complete understanding of the entire Bible before they can be baptized. Some think that they must know all the Bible teaches on all subjects. Thus, they must have complete understanding. Because of this, they think they do not know enough to be baptized, nor do they think that they can ever know enough to be scripturally baptized. Now we must understand that knowledge and understanding of what the New Testament teaches is certainly necessary. It is required. However, consider the many accounts of conversion throughout the book of Acts, such as the eunuch from our text. They were converted to Christ after one sermon. They were convicted of their sins. They knew what they needed to do in order to be saved, and they took the necessary steps. Now, Jesus stated that more teaching must follow baptism. Matthew chapter 28, verses 19 and 20. What we normally call the Great Commission, he says there, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father 
and of the Son, <clears throat> and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. So they needed to know enough in order to be baptized, but at that point, the stage of being a, new nor, a newborn babe in Christ, they were then expected to be taught all things that Jesus had taught his apostles. You cannot be taught something if you already know it. And most teenagers think they already know it. So they better hurry up and move out while mom and daddy are ignorant and while they know everything. That, unfortunately, is the mindset of many today. They already know it all. While it is not possible to know everything the Bible teaches as an alien sinner, one who has never obeyed the gospel, it is also not a requirement to know everything the Bible teaches. You must know enough to understand what is required of you, and then the teaching begins upon your baptism. <clears throat> if one has heard enough of the gospel in order to understand that Jesus is the Son of God, to understand what repentance is and then to do so, to understand the need to publicly confess their faith in Christ and his deity, and then once accomplished, this person is qualified to be baptized. And when they do follow through with that, they're a Christian. Now, rising from that watery grave, one is now a new creature, a babe in Christ, and now on the path of growth and development. 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 1 and 2. Unfortunately, this false idea of the need for complete understanding of the scriptures hinders one from being baptized. Number nine, an improper value of self can often hinder one from being baptized. Some, and I would say many more as the days go on, think that they are not good enough or even worthy enough to be loved by God and to receive salvation from Him. They often ask, how can God ever love somebody like me? Do we realize from Matthew chapter 10 verses 29 through 31 that God loves all of his creation? <clears throat> Verse 29 says, Are not two sparrows sold for a farthing? And one of them shall not fall on the ground without your father? But the very hairs of your head are all numbered. Fear ye not therefore. Ye are of more value than many sparrows. God pays attention to even those little sparrows that you see flooding around your house. How much more so would he give to his children, to humans? After all, mankind is made in the image of God. He sent his son to die for us, John chapter 3 verse 16. And he desires that each and every one of us would come to know Jesus and ultimately obtain salvation, 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 4. One must realize that baptism is meant for the sinner and not the saint. Once a Christian, more spiritual growth occurs, Colossians chapter 3, verses 1 through 14. Consider then the Apostle Paul and the myriad of great evils that he committed as a Pharisee. Yet we know that God forgave him, a murderer of Christians. Why? Because Paul complied with the divine terms of pardon. God fathered our spirit and thus desires to have fellowship with each and every one of us. This can only be accomplished by obeying his will. To regain that fellowship with our spiritual father. God values each and every one of us. Do not let this false sense of value, or really the lack thereof, hinder you from being baptized. Number 10. The time of day or night can often hinder one from being baptized. 
Some have the false sense that baptism can only occur during certain times. They think that baptism must only occur after a sermon has concluded, perhaps a specific service for baptisms. But these are denominational concepts. They have no basis in the New Testament teaching. The sermon of Acts chapter 2 was interrupted and baptisms occurred. Peter and the other apostles were preaching and they were interrupted Verse 36, Therefore let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made that same Jesus, whom ye hath crucified, both Lord and Christ. Now when they had heard this, being the audience there, they were pricked in their heart and said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Then Peter said unto them, Repent, and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. Our text shows that baptism can occur anywhere, anytime. Verse 38 of Acts chapter 8. They were in the desert, riding in a chariot. They came to a large enough body of water to bury an individual, and baptism occurred. The Philippian jailer and his family. Acts chapter 16, verse 25 through 20, uh, 33. Obeying the gospel is an urgent matter. You never know just how much time you have. And you never know when your time on this earth will end. Nor do we know when God will call time itself to an end. Thus, a scripturally qualified person must never wait to be baptized, regardless of the time of day or night. And number 11, love for the world will hinder one from being baptized. When we love the world, when we put more stock in the earth and everything tied to it, we are enemies of God. Romans chapter 8 verse 7, James chapter 4 verse 4. We are warned against having this type of attachment to the world. In 1 John chapter 2 verses 15 through 17. Love not the world neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world passeth away, and the lust thereof. But he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. Many, unfortunately, do not possess... The mind of Moses in Hebrews chapter 11 verses 24 through 27 where he gave up the pleasures that were found in Egypt and would rather suffer just as Christ would suffer to be faithful to God. Instead they choose the path that leads to destruction Matthew chapter 7 verses 13 and 14. Until one is ready to properly and extensively apply Matthew chapter 6 verse 33 they will remain a child of Satan and thus hindered from salvation. <clears throat> now this morning we have noted several things that might hinder one from being baptized. And unfortunately many people fall into at least one of these categories, sometimes multiple. We read when the eunuch was baptized that he went on his way rejoicing, verse 39 of our text. He believed that Jesus was the Christ and is the Christ who had died for the sins of the entire world. Taking the, the gospel in its entirety, we know that he also repented of his sins. He publicly confessed his faith in Christ as the Son of God. And we saw, we read that later on he was baptized for the remission of his sins. His sins were remitted. Are you accountable before God and have, you, and have yet to become a Christian? What hinders you from being baptized? What are you allowing to come between you and your salvation? What answer do you have to this? And now why tarriest thou? Arise and be baptized. Wash away thy sins, calling on the name of the Lord. Well, you might say, well, I have already been baptized. 
I'm a member of pick a denomination. Well, if you consider the doctrines of Roman Catholicism, Presbyterianism, Methodism, Lutheranism, and several other isms, they practice infant baptism. Now, there are several things wrong with that. But two to note, an infant does not have the wherewithal to comply with any of the terms of salvation. That baby cannot repent of sins, for that child has no sin. That child cannot confess Christ publicly. And what they usually refer to as baptism is typically sprinkling. So we're going to dip our fingers in some water and we're going to squirt some water in that baby's face. That is not a scriptural baptism. That is an unauthorized act on their part. Other denominations that practice immersion in water hold that it is either optional and thus not necessary for one's salvation or that it is used in order to join their respective denomination. The New Testament does not teach either of these ideas. It does, however, teach that baptism is necessary to wash away one's sins. And an individual that is accountable before God, thus knowing that they're in error, having the ability to publicly confess Christ, that's an eligible person. And when one does put on their Lord in baptism, they do not join a church. The Lord adds them to his church. Acts chapter 2 verse 47. One cannot join the Lord's church. You might join a congregation, but you have already been added to the Lord's church when you have complied with his terms of pardon. Jesus said, Go ye therefore and teach all Nathan, nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. Matthew chapter 28 verse 19. Unless you have been baptized after this manner, meaning after the authority of from God, you have not been scripturally baptized, even if you have been immersed. Now, if you, as an alien sinner, one who has not become a Christian, wish to be baptized, why not take the steps necessary at this time? Or, as an erring member of the church, why not be restored? If you have either of these needs, make it known as together we stand and sing at this time.